All righty. Good day. Uh, ILM 310305CB, closed loop control part B. Um, pretty straightforward ILM, not a lot of depth in this one today. Uh, a couple of pretty major issues, but nothing, uh, nothing too deep. So in this ILM, we're going to learn the effect of nonlinearity uh, and what, how it affects the control loop. We're also going to learn how we can reduce instability issues that are caused uh, by nonlinearity in a process loop. Objective one uh, asks us to explain control strategies for nonlinear processes. So basically what we're going to start out, uh, we'll define linear and nonlinear, and then we'll look at the effects of uh, nonlinearity on load disturbances and set point disturbances. And that's pretty much everything that we're going to discuss today. So we'll start out talking about linear control loops and the definition of a linear control loop. Uh, control loop is considered to be linear if under normal conditions the transfer function or the gain uh, is the same at all operating points. This means that a step made at any point in the range will have the same output response. And the graph that we show here uh, has 10% uh, input change. And you can see every step here is consistently a 10% output change. Uh, if that occurs throughout the operating range from 0 to 100%, as we see in this graph, we can say that the loop has a linear response. We largely define it by static gain, um, but again, static gain is, is static gain. It's just one component of the uh, transfer function. Uh, and why I'm mentioning that is um, when we're talking about a load disturbance, uh, a load disturbance affects the process and as a result affects the transfer function for the process whereas a set point change doesn't do that quite as as much um, so we'll have a look uh, comparing uh, load changes to set point changes um, so we'll, we'll put it in simpler terms and, and talk about static gain but do understand that uh, when we change the static gain we're effectively changing the transfer function which represents how the loop responds. A control loop is considered to be linear if the static gain is the same throughout its operating range. So if we were looking at the previous graph and we made a 10% step change and every step change uh, resulted in 10% output, we could say that it is linear. Uh, we can verify this by using that step test that we shot on the previous, uh, previous slide in order to determine that. Um, the best gain to use when we're configuring or tuning any particular loop is that uh, the gain that's closest to the normal operating point. So if you're normally operating at 60%, uh, you're going to want to pick the gain value um, at 60%. If you're operating at 80%, you're going to want to pick the gain value at 80%. Uh, and it doesn't make any difference if the loop is linear uh, because it'll all be the same. But the reality of it is, is that uh, most loops are at least a little bit nonlinear. Um, so we have to be able to determine whether or not our gain is consistent. Uh, one way we can tell our gain is consistent is by looking at a graph uh, like this here and drawing a little rise over run triangle. Uh, and if you took this rise over run tri triangle and the values uh, that are associated with them on the horizontal and vertical axes here and applied them to the output input formula, you would find that no matter where you slid this triangle up and down the line, you're going to have the same gain. Uh, and you can tell that because the line is straight. <clears throat> so a linear control loop will provide the same control at any operating point because the transfer function and the static gain is the same anywhere in its range. So that's pretty straightforward. When we get into nonlinear control loops, this tells us that the transfer function changes throughout the operating range. And because of that, we consider the loop to be nonlinear. And you can see here, uh, using the same 10% steps that I did in the very first uh, image, you'll see that this 10% step made about a 4% change. This 10% step made about a 6% change. This 10% step made about a 10% change. So everywhere along uh, this graph here and this line, the static gain is different. If I was to draw a triangle here, I get a really high gain because of the slope of this line. If I drew a triangle here, I'd get a low gain because of the slope of that line. And that's what we're addressing in this lecture today. So most processes, um, as we've discussed up till now, uh, culminate 
uh, with, the, with the characteristics of uh, an integrating a first order and a dead time process, which leads them to be uh, largely uh, multi-capacity processes. Uh, and as such, they're subject to having the uh, KP, T1 time, and dead time change throughout the range. If any one of these does, then the loop will be nonlinear. And this is the case for most loops. And you can see in this graph, uh, as I move this triangle up and down the line, you'll see that I get different gain values as we uh, go up and down that line. This is important again because we have to select a gain value that works well in the operating range that we intend to run in. Uh, and as such, it will run best in that operating range, but it will run differently in other operating ranges because the gain is different. And we have to be aware of that so that we can adapt to it. So when we're tuning a loop, we usually tune for the point where we'll normally be operating. And because that gain varies elsewhere in the range, the PID settings that we make at that operating point may not work at another point in the range. So long story short, a standard PID controller does not provide good control for all operating points in a nonlinear process, which we have defined as most processes at this point. So where does that nonlinearity come from? It shows uh, in this graph here that the gain of the plant, GP, is a function of the gain of the valve, the gain of the process, and the gain of the transmitter. They all have potential non-linearity, some of them more so than others. The final control element, for example, has unique characteristics. Some are designed to be linear, as we see in this graph. Others are not. Uh, even when they're designed to be linear, they may not necessarily be linear due to uh, installation or flow conditions. Uh, and this can re be represented using something called a distortion coefficient. Uh, don't worry too much about any depth in this distortion coefficient, but do understand that uh, a valve acts differently at different points in its operating range. Uh, and this is kind of a representation uh, of that. You'll see that um, different process characteristics and different distortion coefficients will have an effect on uh, the amount of flow and the way that uh, a valve performs. And these curves can be used to help uh, linearize uh, a loop if it was nonlinear. Uh, so the first section we're going to talk about in terms of how do we fix a nonlinear control loop usually has to deal with selecting a proper valve. So in a perfect world where we have a linear process, we could use a linear valve. But if it was not, as we've discussed, it's probably the case, uh, we can use a different type of valve trim in order to try to fix the linearity issues. Um, so we'll look at valves again a little bit uh, later here. Processes, uh, as we know, may be linear or nonlinear as well. The IL ILM shows in the steam exchanger uh, example that will increase 10 degrees Celsius with every 10% step in steam flow. This is linear, so it's represented by uh, this type of graph here. I increase it by 10, it goes up by 10, up by 10, up by 10. A nonlinear process shown in the ILM is pH control, and we'll talk about this again in chemistry, so do pay some attention to this as you're reading it. Um, Notice the difference in the I.O. curves. I make a 10% change here, and there's a little bit of a difference, another 10% change, a very small difference, another 10% change, very small difference, another 10% change, very small difference. And then suddenly I make this 10% change, and I get this huge difference. So pH is wild, wildly nonlinear, uh, and really is the, uh, the bookend in terms of, of nonlinearity as a pH process. So the process itself. Uh, as you can see here, could possibly contribute a lot of nonlinearity or possibly none. Transmitters, they are the most linear of all the components. Um, modern transmitters are almost linear. You can say that they're pretty much linear 99.99% of the time. Uh, the sensing element itself may be nonlinear. Uh, the measure signal coming out of it may be nonlinear, like a square root extraction signal, for example. Um, but the transmitter electronics can be used to eliminate these nonlinearities. Um, unless we set them up otherwise, they're going to be generally considered linear. Uh, the only application that we really uh, have to do any modification uh, in particular is differential pressure uh, flow measurement where we have to do square root extraction. And again, that's an electronic function that the transmitters can generally handle these days. 
So how do we deal with all the potential nonlinearities that we get from a process or a valve or a transmitter? We learned that the combination of these things make up a plant, which may or may not be linear. We know that we can keep, uh, we can control the loop if we can keep it in a range uh, or at the set point where it is linear, or at least we're aware of how it's functioning. Basic control parameters, meaning the PID settings that we put into it can allow us to manage some nonlinearity if it is slight. And the ILM states that if it's less than 20% nonlinearity, we can generally control that with a PID type controller. Um, or if we're always at the same set point, it should work just fine. But if it's not, then we're gonna have uh, some problems. So if we can't do that, we can't stay in the same set point uh, area, um, we have to do something. And this leads us kind of into the second section of the lecture here is how do we deal with nonlinearity? So there's a few things that we can do. First, we can choose a control valve, as I said earlier, or a trim for that valve that will make it more linear, or at least the opposite of uh, the process nonlinearities in order to try to straighten it out. The second option we have is to detune the loop so that is less unstable in those operating ranges uh, that we're not normally operating in. If we have a situation where we, uh, you know, one day we're at 50% set point, the other day we're at 80% set point, another day we're at 30% set point, that poses a problem. So we'll have to do something called detuning and we'll look at some processes uh, used for detuning. Uh, the third option is to use something called a multipoint characterizer. Uh, to linearize the loop and basically what a characterizer is, is uh, a method of plotting the response as it sits and then programming the controller to output a different value uh, relative to our location in the range in order to linearize or straighten out the line that we get in a graph. And we'll look at that a little bit more specifically as well. And finally, we end up with the most complicated uh, method uh, of dealing with nonlinearity is using something called an adaptive control strategy. And there's several of them, um, but basically what an adaptive control strategy means is that we'll be applying different tuning values at different points in the operating range um, based on some calculations that we can make. So first we'll look at control valves uh, and how we can use them to correct nonlinearity. So uh, it comes down to choosing the right valve for the application. Uh, if the process has inherent characteristics, um, and the process, again, is, a, is a, a function of all the piping and the valves and everything that's been engineered into it, um, if it has those characteristics, they can be very difficult to change. So the most uh, likely uh, or easiest thing that we can do to try to correct ourselves is to choose a valve that can cancel out those characteristics. So the things that we can change uh, in terms of valves are the valve trim, so equal percentage valve, linear valve, a quick opening valve, uh, whatever that might be, and or the size uh, of the valve itself. And we'll look at some graphic representations here on the next slide. So here's an example, uh, shows us a controller uh, and our plant over here, which is a, a result uh, our gain of our plant is a result of the gain of our valve here, which you can see is a nonlinear curve, uh, the gain of our process, which is an opposite nonlinear curve, and the gain of our transmitter, which we said is basically linear and it stays that way for most applications. So in this case here, uh, if I know my process reacts in this way, I can select valve trim that reacts this way, and in essence, they'll cancel themselves out. If I have a process uh, that is relatively linear and a transmitter that is relatively linear. Um, this graph here represents a valve that's too large. I start opening my valve a little bit down here, zero to 10%, and I get quite a lot of flow right off, right off the top, and that's, that's no good, right? So in order for me to fix this, I could get myself an equal percentage valve, which would straighten out this line. So this represents a valve that's too large, too much flow, uh, in the opening portion of the valve stroke. Uh, this one over here shows the, the remedy for that uh, particular situation here by taking uh, this quick opening valve and changing it into an equal percentage valve, I can eliminate uh, the nonlinearities uh, to some 
major degree uh, just by selecting different types of valve trim. So that's what we that's what we can do by selecting the proper um, valve trim and or valve size in order to reduce some nonlinearities. Detuning was the next thing that we mentioned that can be uh, utilized to um, alleviate the problems that are associated with nonlinearities throughout the op operating range. Uh, again, assuming that we're not going to be in the uh, normal set point range all the time. So for example, here in the normal set point range, I have a slope, uh, a very shallow uh, slope line here, which tells me I have a very fairly low gain. Uh, at lower set point here, I have a very steep slope, which tells me it's a very high gain. Um, and up here at the high set point, you'll see I have a slope somewhere kind of in between. So it tells me I have a gain probably between these two. Um, what we can do then uh, for detuning or the, the premise of detuning is if we tune at the point of the highest gain, so this area here, we can reduce instability in these other areas in exchange for sluggishness, meaning that it'll work just perfectly right here, but we move it to a different area, it's going to perform sluggishly. And sluggish is something that may be something that you can handle, maybe you can't handle that. If you can, this works great. If you can't, then we move on to uh, something else. So if we tune at the lowest gain, um, for example, this gain here, the loop will become unstable in high gain areas that is generally worse, meaning that it has to, it doesn't have the capability with the settings that we've made here to react fast enough in either of these zones here. So it's generally worse. Um, so that's why we tune uh, tune at, uh, at the highest gain here so that it, it doesn't get overreactive. We'd rather have it sluggish than be overreactive. <clears throat> Third method uh, is called characterization. As I said, it's a function of doing some testing and finding out what the actual outputs are for every set point change, and then punching in some values into uh, the characterizer, which can be a, a function block in the PLC or something built into the uh, transmitter or the controller that basically just says when we're putting in 10 uh, and I'm getting out 11, what what do I have to what do I have to do to change this? And it's a straight uh, table conversion here. So we create a table for the IO graph that is the opposite of what we're actually getting in order to straighten it out, and we enter it into the controller. So here, for example, uh, my PV. Uh, is 10 and my CO is 9. You can see I get different values here. And the idea here is we put in the value that is opposite of this in order to get this line uh, to straighten itself out. I'm not going to go into um, all the details um, of figuring this all out, but again, the idea is to do a test, you get uh, an output of what is actually occurring, and then you do a little bit of math and then you tell the controller uh, when I put in 10, um, instead of me getting normally 11 off of that output, I'm going to want to get 9. And if I get 9, that's going to give me my 10% PV, which is what's showing, uh, what's showing here. So it's uh, not as complicated as it looks, um, but this is something that is done kind of once off the table or off of the test. And we can use this uh, strategy to straighten out uh, our nonlinearity. Lastly, we look at uh, adaptive control strategies, uh, and there's a couple of them. Uh, they're sometimes called gain scheduling, and that just means that we uh, use different gains at different points in our operating uh, operating range. So we'll, it'll create gains that keeps things even. Uh, again, this is usually done by a function block in the controller. Uh, that we can say uh, when we're at 70%, use this gain, or at 20%, use this gain, and when we're at 50%, uh, use this gain. Okay, so the way it works, or at least the first example here, and I don't think I'll walk through all of the examples, but this gives you a general idea of the whole idea of this adaptive gain here. Um, we, we draw a slope line on three different regions of our operating range here in order to determine the gain in those regions uh, where our slope, slope, slope lines cross. We have an intersection point and we can draw a horizontal line across over there that isolates one of the regions. We have these two slope lines crossing here, which causes an intersection point, which will define another region. 
and then we by default get the, the third region out of it here. Uh, we set limits in between these regions and each one of these regions have different tuning. So if I'm operating below limit one, I'll use region one tuning parameters. If I'm uh, in between here, I'll use region two tuning parameters. And if I'm in this region here, I'll use region three tuning parameters. Um, and that's the general idea of all of the adaptive gain strategies, although some of them um, have partic particular characteristics that are kind of uh, associated with them, but they're all uh, basically the same, applying uh, calculated gain values specific to a certain range or region in the operating, uh, in the operating range. Here's one called a uh, notch controller, uh, incredibly similar to the one we just looked at here. Um, the difference between the two of them comes down to this first point here, and it uses two, two gains instead of three. Uh, I'm not going to get into the math here, but basically what we, we do is we find three gains, just like we did in the previous example, uh, and we end up deriving called a notch gain, uh, which is an average of KP1, this gain, and this gain, divided by this gain, and it gives us a number that we can multiply um, our controller gain by in order to make a consistent operating uh, gain that gets applied throughout the operating range uh, and this keeps the static gain mostly uh, constant. Okay so next we are going to spend a little bit trying to identify what causes or what consists or what we consider to be uh, load disturbances uh, that produce nonlinearities here. So this is a steam exchanger uh, example that we've used throughout um, the lecture so far, we have uh, steam coming in and heating up a uh, cold oil flow. Um, usually our load disturbance in this case here, um, I, I, in classroom I'd ask you, well, what could potentially be constituting as a, as a load disturbance? And the load disturbance in this example here is, our, uh, is related to our cold oil. If we have an increase in flow or a decrease in flow, uh, of our oil, that would be considered a load disturbance if the inlet temperature of this cold oil was to uh, significantly differ, uh, that would create a load disturbance. Um, and we have to um, be aware of what the potential disturbances could be. Uh, quality of the steam, for example, could be a load disturbance. Let's just look here at the possible disturbances. Uh, changes in the steam heating values so the quality of the steam uh, is a minor possible disturbance. Uh, changing in the oil composition, another minor uh, disturbance. Changing in the inlet temperature of that oil, minor disturbance. Environmental changes like temperature, wind, or rain, again, fairly minor in terms of disturbances. But the one that's the big one here is the change of the oil flow rate that we put through that exchanger. This would be the major and most common type of the load disturbance that we deal with in an operating uh, in an operating plant. Most of these things are going to remain consistent uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Generally, when we do production changes or uh, output changes, we're changing the, the flow, uh, flow through the plant, uh, and that has to tie in with, in this example, the oil flow rate. We said earlier, if the disturbance does not affect the transfer function by more than 20%, we can get PID to compensate for it. Um, but again, we just need to be aware of, uh, of these disturbances and how they uh, potentially affect our, our decisions on making a control strategy. So looking again at the steam exchanger here, um, we, can, we can find the proof of a gain change that's uh, affected by uh, the amount of flow uh, through that exchanger. And this is a representation where I've um, just grabbed the formula that we use in order to make the graph here. And um, I changed one of the variables here just to show you how throughput uh, can change our gain. So uh, without going into super duper detail here, I'll just look at some of the variables here. Uh, the energy in or the heating capacity of the steam is on top here. The energy required to heat the oil uh, represented by CP here. Uh, and QMP represents the oil flow changes in the next three calculations. So the only thing I'm going to change in these three calculations, and the numbers are arbitrary here, is the amount of flow going through the exchanger. So for example here, at uh, half a cube flowing through there, 
my gain is going to be uh, about two. So low throughput down here, I have a very high gain. I increase my throughput to one, moving it over here, I get a little bit lower gain. And I increase my throughput to two cubes, for example, way over here, and I get a much lower gain. So this uh, is long drawn out version of showing you that uh, the load disturbance in this case, uh, the amount of oil that we're putting through this thing effectively change, changes the, the, um, the gain throughout the operating range and as in effect uh, also our transfer function. So we have to be able to uh, compensate for it. Um, for most temperature and composition processes, the static change decreases as the flow or load increases. And we saw that here as we increased our flow, our static gain ended up coming down. So how do we deal with these load disturbances and these gains that change? They're similar to the solutions that we've looked at prior to the inherent nonlinearities uh, from the equipment in the process, the valve, uh, et cetera. Um, we have the same options here. We can detune which means that we're going to tune at the highest gain area in order to reduce instability across the board at the expense of possibly being sluggish in some areas. Second option, again, uh, proper valve trim and or characterization. And then the third uh, option is adaptive control strategies. So the same uh, strategies can be applied, whether we're talking about in here characteristics or the process load disturbance characteristics. Um, why do I have this in here? An equal percentage valve will help linearize for a load disturbance, but not a set point disturbance. I can't remember the context of this right away, but I believe it has something to do with uh, the speed at which the disturbance is introduced. A load disturbance is generally a slower changing disturbance uh, than a set point change. Uh, and I think that's what this speaks to, but I can't recall off the top of my head what, what that was about. All right, so we've looked at detuning, we've looked at valve trim and characterization, we've looked at adaptive control strategies. Um, we're gonna look at uh, adaptive gain control, another adaptive gain control strategy here. Uh, again, adaptive gain simply means that we're applying different gain values in different operational areas. Um, well, I guess this is another example I just decided I wasn't gonna walk you through on here. Uh, the gains are calculated the same way as, as we did on the previous example where we had the different uh, lines representing the static gain in different areas. Uh, and then from that, we apply the, uh, the math or formulas uh, specific to this particular adaptive gain control strategy. And this is the one where we take zone three uh, plus zone one, and then we divide it by zone two. Uh, it's not very complicated. Okay, so what if we have to deal with set point and load disturbances? So there are situations when, where this happens. I mean, most, most plants will have a set point where they operate, operate at most of the time, you know, like way at the top, 101% for most places. Um, but there are places where we get set point changes that happen regularly um, and also the normal load disturbances that are, uh, that are involved as well. Uh, in order to be able to compensate for both set point and load disturbances, we're gonna need something called an advanced uh, adaptive control strategy. Uh, and this really takes things out of our hands for the most part uh, and goes into a programming uh, configuration map scenario. Um, where the system will cons constantly monitor the situations that are occurring and will do gain calculation uh, based on the data that are collected and uh, synchronously change the gain setting values in order to compensate for uh, load disturbances and or set point disturbances as the process goes through its, uh, its operating uh, procedure. So there's a lot of uh, I guess kind of general things in here, but it's it's all about uh, what we can do in order to to compensate for uh, the inherent nonlinearities that exist in almost every single uh, control loop out there. So that is the end of today's lecture. There was nothing uh, nothing too terrible there for you guys in terms of math or anything. So I hope uh, I hope you enjoyed yourselves.